Martin Evans has the ability to see an opportunity and to seize it. While selling new business systems, he identified a supply weakness. From businessman to con man, Martin Evans took millions of pounds from an unsuspecting public at home and abroad. At one point, my husband wanted to fly down there and just, you know, grab him by the throat. You give me a call tomorrow and let me know what's happening. I think if you'd been in the same place, I think you might have been uh, bamboozled by him. He was very plausible. Bogus investment schemes funded a millionaire lifestyle. It was like a film script, as Evans travelled the world first class on a false passport. But this detective spent years on his trail, determined to bring him to justice. I got him. That's what went through my mind. We've got him. It's only a matter of time now. <laughs> Martin Evans lived a life of luxury. But it was a life funded by others. Well. Yeah. They've gone through the roof. It's much, much better. He left thousands of victims no. behind him. No. Week in, week out, we're on Martin Evans' trail more than 12 years ago. He'd conned a disabled children's charity in Swansea, but fled when people started asking questions. He left workers in other offices to cope with inquiries. We've got yeah. some very serious uh, questions we'd uh, like to ask them about yeah. their, yeah, but about their no, operation. I mean, we did have a few phone calls and then they stopped, you know. Uh, you've no idea at all where, they, where they've gone no, to? No, I haven't got a forwarding address for them, no. Even then, he was elusive. Martin Evans came from a working class family in a South Wales mining town. From there, he began his extraordinary life of crime, and there was nothing in his background to hint at what was to come. You know, they were just average, average family. He didn't have any big money, and he didn't inherit any big money. You know, there was definitely not, not a silver spoon in his mouth, I can assure you. He worked in the mines, and uh, from there, he decided to open a video shop. He had noticed a uh, cap in the market that wanted to fill in, there wasn't a uh, video shop in Bont, and he went along, he took a gamble. Local people paid £10 for lifetime membership. But in a sign of what was to come, the video shop was a short-lived venture. No, I don't, I don't think they know. <laughs> By the mid-1980s, he was making good money, then came fame. Martin Evans has the ability to see an opportunity and to seize it. Already he has substantial assets and could well be in the way to be an even richer man. It was the first time he came to the public's attention and the last time the publicity was good. Martin Evans is our Young Business Person of the Year. Well done. Terrific. Fantastic. Well <laughs> <laughs> first heard of him um, after he won the Young Businessman of the Year award and he became quite prominent after the programme. I think he was nominated by one of his staff as the, um, the model boss um, uh, for his double glazing company and uh, yeah I mean it, 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 it was good to see somebody young winning that type of award, um, especially somebody local. But it wasn't so good when he came across Evans years later through the building trade. Evans continued to live the good life, even as the business was wound up a few months later, leaving debts to dozens of local firms. It was to become a familiar pattern. Right. He wanted the rich life. He, he, you know, he always fancied being mega rich, and he did want the fancy cars and Rolex watches and uh, this and the other. He, he had a fantastic charisma about him. And uh, unless you met the guy yourself, you know, you can't really explain him, but, you know, he was a really nice guy. But not everyone was taken in. When Nick Ellsmore was approached out of the blue by Evans with a business proposition, he was very wary. 
I think the main thing that, that we were suspicious of was the fact that um, he was working in a field which we had some experience and a lot of local knowledge of, um, and the company didn't appear to have any history, and yet Martin appeared to be doing very, very well out of it, which again is one of these things that kind of triggers a few alarm bells. Hi, mate. All right. Yeah, very good, thanks. How are you? Six companies came and went in as many years. Looks absolutely brilliant. Excellent, excellent. They left behind a trail of creditors, which grew ever longer. Very good. That's excellent. And his business reputation grew worse and worse. I think it's really going to fly, this one. Uh, you're a boy, I. We inadvertently ended up working for one of his companies um, on a development in Pondadawi. At the end of the contract, there were numerous people who were chasing Martin for money. Um, I remember going to their offices down in um, uh, Salubrious Passage in Swansea, if I remember rightly, um, and sitting there one day, and there were just a stream of people in and out trying to collect cheques, um, most of them with no success whatsoever, as far as I could see. Eventually, Evans' debts caught up with him, and he was declared bankrupt. But then came the first sign of how Martin Evans really operated. In 1993, he was jailed for 15 months for fraud. The attraction is there, isn't it? Millionaire lifestyle, if you can get away with it. The attraction is definitely there. You could see that. Well, that type of personality with him, he likes the high life. There's no doubt about that. And I think that's what's probably attracted him to this way of life. Dick Jones, a former South Wales police detective, helped to put him away. But he had no idea then that Evans was to become his full-time job. While in prison, Evans met another con man called Michael Richards. This was to be a lucrative partnership with the public their main target. Are you going to be very, very happy? First came a get-rich-quick scam. It's gone, it's, it's gone ballistic. Evans had jumped on a bandwagon. It was back in the early 90s when there were lots of money circulation schemes uh, where you put a certain amount of money in and expected to get uh, more out. Uh, there were lots of these types of schemes around at that time and Platinum Society was one of them. Neil Ogden is disabled and works from his house. He ran a home workers magazine called BizOp News. At the time, Martin Evans' scheme seemed like a genuine investment opportunity. You were supposed to get um, a return from uh, however many units you put in. You put in £55 for one for per unit and you got an amount out. Um, and then the idea was that you put in more units to sustain the money plan. But of course, that never happened. And that's why money circulation schemes didn't work eventually and were eventually made illegal anyway. It was the last Neil saw of his money, but not the last time he came across one of Evans' cons. Yeah, no, the figures are absolutely fantastic. Seriously now. This scheme lasted just a few months and left hundreds out yeah. of pocket. Mm. Okay, then. And it was at this time that Evans and Michael Richards were conning the disabled children's charity. Very, very happy with the numbers. He had a bold face. I mean, he was a very bold, conniving man. He, but he was, you know, uh, he was so convincing. It, it's it's hard to believe. He, he was just one one of the world's fraudsters. He, he was a, a, a clever guy, clever and manipulative. A retired businessman and former officer in the Army's Special Forces, Bill Batty, was looking into an unusual investment opportunity some ten years ago. He thought farming ostriches would be a good way to make money. An advert for the Ostrich Centre near Swansea caught Bill Batty's eye. But this was Martin Evans's latest money-making plan. It was run by a, a young fellow who presented himself very well. I was allowed to look round the farm, taken round the breeding centre and shown the facilities they had, and I found that was very convincing. And he came over well, did he? This was Martin Evans we're talking about. Yes, Martin Evans. He, d he did at the time. I didn't uh, dash into it. I went down there eventually three times before I decided to buy two birds there. 
So into Martin Evans' ostrich centre, Bill Batty put his investment of £20,000. When you consider that a mature female ostrich can live for 80 years, she can lay between 30 and 100 eggs a year. Uh, they can be incubated. Uh, you've then got ostrich feathers, which are very expensive. You've got ostrich skin, which is used, used for handbags, briefcases, shoes and the like. And of course, you've got the meat. At the time, if you recall, it was at the height of the BSC crisis. And this was hailed as the new, the new meat that will be on everybody's dinner table. They produced um, lovely colour brochures. In them, it gives all the, uh, the options, partnership options, uh, annual returns, guaranteed uh, income over five years of 40,000. And I think when people saw these, I think they were impressed. And if you look at the back of it, according to the back of it, yeah, uh, the United Kingdom, Jersey, Spain, Portugal, Germany, Belgium, France and Italy. It was all in Dunvant in Swansea. He's a very plausible guy, uh, very pleasant to, to talk to. He's qu quite likeable in his own way. He's very popular with uh, members of the public that he comes into contact with. Just down the road from the ostrich farm in Dunvant, retired GP Peter Johns was recommended to invest by his accountant. As both an animal lover and investor, this seemed ideal. He and his wife cashed in a savings account and spent £7,000 on an ostrich they called Florence. I don't believe that I'm too gullible, or, or we are, both of us are too gullible, but we are certainly taken in with this. It seemed, it seemed a good idea. We bought a, a, a growing ostrich, you know, as I say, for about December. It wasn't laying, but it was going to lay the following year. And that's when we thought Florence would be doing the business, you know. That's the name of your ostrich? That was the name of my ostrich, our, our ostrich, yes. We <laughs> probably went up every fortnight just to have a look, you know, and take the dog for a walk and we'd go up to the farm and have a look at the, how they're getting on. Yes, we frequently went up. But we didn't know that money was flowing out. What sort of man was Martin Evans when you met him and how did he come over? I quite liked him. He was very plausible, very well spoken. Um, no, we were completely taken in. Martin Evans, he, oh, he could charm the birds of the trees. I mean, you know, he, had, he convinced people that should have known better. But he was that type of guy. You know, you, you just, you ought to believe him. Two chicks are allocating one per month plus an extra chick on months three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Dozens of investors believed Evans, and this was a very lucrative venture for him and his wife. But just weeks after money started coming into the company, they were stealing it. The money was siphoned away to offshore accounts in uh, Channel Islands and the Isle of Man to other companies which were the benefit which Martin Evans was the beneficial owner of. There was no money left to keep the company running. Good, good. What can I do you for? <laughs> Within six months, the company had collapsed. It had been set up to fail from the start, and more than 100 investors had paid in £850,000. That's right. Yeah, yeah. No, no, there'll be enough for everyone, mate. He designed this scam in prison. He designed it all. He'd done the profile. He didn't do it in a fancy office in Mayfair. he done it in Nick. I mean, I think it's really going to fly, this one. <laughs> it can't fail, really. Do you know what I mean? Police were called in to investigate, but some of Evans' victims were determined to fight back. I decided to attend the liquidators' meeting, and while I was there, uh, because I'm not a very good loser, I, I spoke to all the other owners and said that I would like to really try and set something up to try and recover the bird. Bill Batty arranged trucks and staff to rescue the ostriches, and when he got to Evans' farm, his special forces background came into its own. I was confronted by the, the man he had left in charge of the farm, who was, had closed the farm access gate and was leaning firmly on it and just totally refusing to let us in. I staggered a little against the gate and 
then stood upright and he then said, what's wrong, what's wrong? I, I said, don't, don't worry, I said, it's my heart. I've got some tablets in the car. And that's when I did the, the uh, trip down to my car, which was parked a little distance away. Got some soluble aspirins, which I then chewed and uh, popped one ostentatiously into my mouth in front of him and chewed it. And of course it, it fizzes and puts a bit of foam around your lips. And he was terrified I was, this old fool was gonna have a heart attack in front of his gate. So eventually he gave way and let us in. <laughs> you pretended to have a heart attack to get yeah. in the farm. I did, yes. <laughs> all the birds watching with very great interest see what's going on here. It took three days to collect them all, but when they were counted, there were fewer birds than investors. It was only later when we examined some of the birds we found more than one microchip embedded in under their skin that we realised that he might have sold individual birds more than once. So it was a complete con? I feel slightly stupid for having been convinced by the idea that, that you could make such a, a large profit through an investment like this. You've got to get over it, didn't you? It wasn't all our money, but I mean, it was quite a large slice of our money. And uh, we felt foolish and, and wish we hadn't done it. Anger? But... Anger towards Evans? Oh, yes. Yes. Um... Uh, must have been, wasn't it? Uh, it? It was his fault. But even as police were investigating, Martin Evans was on to an even more lucrative con. And this one seemed easy, luring investors with promises of doubling their money. It would bring in millions. Hello, mate. His old cellmate, Michael Richards, was his partner for Aura Marketing. The sweetener was a healthy chocolate bar costing £40. Mm, well, I, I need another 5000 straight away, really. The scheme was simple, and that's why it attracted so many people into it. What you had to do was purchase a bar, a body bite bar, and then give some feedback on it. If you gave that back to Aura Marketing, they would give you £80 for your time. So your money had doubled. One of many who wanted a slice of the action was Vic Lachanal from Flincher. We filmed him when we were on the trail of Martin Evans. Vic, who has since died, saw Aurum as a new form of market research. I did some basic inquiries really just to find out what it was about um, and decided that uh, it looked like a bit of fun. It also looked like a, a, a quite a quick way of recouping some money. And I didn't see it as a con. Clearly, if I'd seen it as a con, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> I only look stupid. <laughs> the scam was based at this building in Cardiff. And that was a giveaway for one of Martin Evans' previous victims. It was about, probably about four or five years later when I got details of Body Bite from Aura Marketing, um, which I dubbed the world's most expensive biscuit. Quite obviously a money circulation scheme in disguise. I didn't realise it was the same person at first, but I sent off the information and the address that came back was the same address. And doubling your money was too good to resist for thousands of people. The cheques poured in. And at first, for those who took a bite, it seemed a tasty investment. Um, well, I got my first payment back, so I did OK. And of course, that stimulated me to, you know, move the chips in. Vic reinvested £4,000 as the scam grew. You saw your friends invest. You saw your friends profit. You saw that happen. It must be true. And you have to remember the type of individual that sometimes subscribe to these things live on the edge. They are looking for that way out. It is that Del Boy Trotter syndrome. And in terms of individuals, how much money were individuals losing? Well, we have um, evidence to show that some people was were given as much as eight to 10,000 pounds into this scheme. People like a retired police inspector. Uh, one organisation put the proceeds of their church restoration fund into it. People that you wouldn't think would be taken in by this were because of the clever nature of the scheme that it spread by word of mouth. <laughs> in just six months, some 9,000 people invested. They sent in a total of more than four million pounds. very similar to the ostrich center if you look at it there's a, a large amount of uh, inward investment which makes the bank accounts very healthy 
and then it enables the, uh, the account holders to move money to wherever they want to move it. For trading standards officers at that time, that was one of the biggest financial uh, money-making schemes we'd seen. The plan was to lure in enough people by word of mouth, draw in enough money, and then slow it down, delay the payments, and then not make any at all, and disappear. Yeah. Martin Evans and his partner Michael Richards did disappear to start up the same scam in America. We'd had a, an indication that they'd left a few days before from the landlords. So we go into the offices and uh, there's very little there. There is uh, literature, unopened letters. We found eight sacks of mail. Much of it was complaint literature about, you know, I haven't had my money. But we were, in the week, £40,000 in cheques. Again, willing to buy into this scheme. All the things that you'd need to operate an office are long gone. And in the foyer, we have um, as many as uh, 50, 60 people screaming, where are or a marketing? Where is our money? And in that crowd, Vic Lachanal. I think the thing to say that if uh, Martin Evans or his partner were a fox, and this was a fox, uh, this was a hunt. <laughs> I don't think that the, the vote for a ban would have been gone through. <laughs> I think he would have been ripped to pieces. They were not happy people. Uh, of course, uh, lots of these people had put in money that they really couldn't afford to do. America was a lucrative new market. With half a million dollars stolen from UK victims, Aura Marketing Incorporated was launched. One of the first to invest was Peggy Namany from Denver, Colorado. She'd avoided other W money schemes, but was taken in by Aurum. Um, but this just had a viable uh, feel to it. It was a good product. It was, it was tangible. You held it. You could eat it. It was well marketed and and well made. Um, I believe that we spent $1,200 on the first batch. And then as soon as you sent back in all the comment cards, they would pay you $2,400 for that. Peggy reinvested the money and the checks kept coming. When you see it come back in a double amount on a check, um, this creates excitement and hope. And I don't feel it was a greed situation more than it was just hope and excitement. I went out to the flea market, had a big sign, and it said, you know, please test market these bars and fill out a card. And I had people lined up <laughs> for a long ways to try the bars out. Um, I also went down to one of the college campuses and handed them out down there, and everything looked wonderful. So we just felt that it was just their way of marketing the product. But it wasn't long before it all collapsed. Peggy had risked and lost the lot. We took a second out on our home, a second mortgage. Um, we put that in, and then we also took money from our business and placed that in, too. So out of pocket, we were close to um, about $35,000, dollars $40,000 out of pocket, in addition to everything we had made from them and sent back in. So it was a large amount of money. It became a scandal when it emerged so many people had lost so much money. It even made the local television news. These men are waiting outside a Clearwater office building, nervously going through receipts and checks they say they can't cash. The company is called Aura Marketing USA. But things changed about three weeks ago when the money appeared to dry up and a sign on the office today said, Closed. Are you guys going to pay down all the people? I said, get that damn thing out of my face. We tried to ask a man locking up Aram's office when these people would be paid, but he refused to comment. Dozens of agents claim they have some Aram company files in an office nearby. Others placed outside the Aram office, hoping to run into the owners. You're hurt and you're angry, and I, you know, at one point my husband wanted to fly down there and just, you know, grab them by the throat but you know you just it, there's no sense in doing that you just have to move on and it was a, a hard expensive lesson again the American venture had taken in millions in months the FBI did investigate but no charges were brought yet time seemed to be running out for Martin Evans 
He was due in court in Wales for defrauding investors over his ostrich farm near Swansea. He and his wife Maria were facing jail. But when the trial began, Evans abandoned her. He sent a fax address to the judge. And basically what he said is that I'm writing to inform you that due to circumstances beyond my control, I will not be attending the hearing of the 6th of March. And uh, the conclusion was that uh, His Honour uh, Judge Burr issued a, a bench warrant for the arrest of Martin Roy Evans. Martin Evans left his wife and was now on the run with a new girlfriend, a student nurse from his hometown. They fled first to Marbella in Spain, where Evans bought a luxury villa and a half million pound yacht called Phantom. In Miami, Florida, there was even a penthouse apartment. He did enjoy the, uh, there's no doubt about it, the millionaire lifestyle. It was great. It was, many, many appeared to be no object. But it was a millionaire lifestyle funded by another business. <laughs> Martin Evans was now masterminding an international drug smuggling operation. <laughs> oh, excellent. Nice one. Then a breakthrough. Evans had a false identity in the name of a dead child called Paul Kelly, part of a passport fraud. Basically on the line of the Day of the Jackal, they belonged to dead children from a graveyard in Manchester in Hyde. At the time, some 22 or 23 Paul Kelly passports had been issued. We identified that one of the passports, the Paul Kelly, appeared to be Martin Evans. I got him. That's what went through my mind. We've got him. It's only a matter of time now. Evans was now the focus of an international manhunt. US immigration had been put on the alert by Dick Jones, so when Martin Evans next visited in style from Paris, his 18 months on the run were at an end. It was satisfying. It was very satisfying. And uh, as I said, it's a case of you can run, but you can't hide. And uh, that's basically it. Martin Evans is now serving 21 years for drug running and stealing ostrich investors' cash. His wife Maria was given a suspended sentence for her involvement in the ostrich scam. Michael Richards died in a jet ski accident six years ago. The court accepted <laughs> Evans's not guilty pleas on 23 charges related to Orem because he was already serving a long sentence. He now faces seizure of his assets worth an estimated 20 million pounds. He dreamt of the rich life as a young boy and he was determined to have it at all costs. And he did. And, uh, you know, he led a life that most of us would only dream of. Martin Evans comes first, there's no doubt about that. His attitude was that everybody knew it was a risk and they still put money in. I don't think it bothered him. I don't think he had a conscience that way. If he had a conscience, he wouldn't have done what he's done. One person aged 17 to 25 dies on Welsh roads each week. We can week out investigates.